guest is considered one of Canada's most successful entrepreneurs, but her climb to the top wasn't easy. Married at 17, Zara Al-Harazi survived two civil wars before immigrating to Canada from Yemen. She went from being an unemployed mother of three with no post-secondary education to running her own multi-million dollar company. <laughs> Zara is sharing her journey in her new book, What It Takes. Please welcome author, philanthropist, and entrepreneur, Zara Al-Harazi. Welcome, Zara. Zara, we're going to start at the very beginning. You were born in Uganda. You fled uh, because of the Civil War with your family to Yemen, which is where your grandfather's uh, people were from. Yeah. What was it like growing up in the Middle East? Um, it was really different than here. You know, we had just, uh, we were refugees. We had $7 that my dad had hid in his shoes. They had taken everything else when he, when uh, we were leaving the country. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very poor country. Yemen is one of the poorest countries uh, in the world. Um, in the 70s, my mother was one of the first women to drive in the country and one of the first women to work. Wow. And, uh, you know, so she's the reason I, I speak English. English so well and 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 uh, she gave me an edge for sure but it was very different 70% uh, of women in Yemen are illiterate and when we were growing up you know we weren't given options like kids are here you know you can be anything you want to be you can um, oh, <laughs> um, you know we we weren't given those options it was uh, very limited options for girls and 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 uh, a lot of them involved getting married Mm -hmm. Well, at 17, you got married into a prestigious family. I believe the grandson of a former president of Yemen. You guys had decided at 18 to move to North America. What was your experience like? Well, we moved right after. I got married right after high school, and, and we moved straight to Rolla, Missouri, wow. a really small town in, in uh, um, middle America. And uh, it, it was so exciting for me. I had all this freedom that I'd never had before. I could go to the store and leave the house without permission or, or a male accompanying me. And, um, you know, I, I, I started wearing short shorts and belly shirts and, and going to rock concerts and smoking just for a very short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to do everything that people do in movies, you know, that I saw. So it was, it was very exciting, but very quickly, like, there was so much change happening. New country, new marriage, you know, before I knew it... Um, I had a child on one hip and I had a belly out to here and I had a big red minor stamped across my driver's license because I wasn't 21 yet. Oh my yet. gosh. Wow. So wow. it was very different. Yeah. So all of that changed Zara and then another big change because you and your husband decide to leave the States and go back to Yemen to be closer to your family. So tell us about that transition, having experienced all the freedom that you did and then going back to Yemen. So, you know, it, it was almost like any one of you going back to Yemen for the first time because I had now got so used to life in the West and, and having value as, as a woman and as a member of society and, and being able to do what I wanted and, you know, giving birth to my daughters in these nice, clean American hospitals. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, my ex-husband and I were, were back where I didn't have a lot of value. And, and uh, there was, it was just so different for me because all of a sudden things that were normal before before, like, um, you know, like, like a lack of personal space. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, I, I, it was astounding to me that people were right here, you know, and, and, uh, and then we had no running water, very little electricity turned off several times a day, uh, a complete lack of a medical health system. You gave birth and, with a cat in, in your... Uh, in yes, a, a pussy-eyed cat, and uh, it was in the delivery room because they had rats. Wow. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I gave birth to my son um, right after the war. So while we were there, while we were living in Yemen, the civil war between the North and South broke out. And, you know, one, one morning, like about a, a 50 tanks rolled past our front door and, and, and warplanes started taking off. And, and all of a sudden we were at war with the South and we had all these scud missiles coming at us every night. And so it was just lots and lots of transition again. Yeah. By the time you were 24, you had three children, and you and your husband eventually fled Yemen and came to Canada. Yes. So uh, you decided at that point, at some point when you came here, that you wanted to go back to school, and the arts were sort of seemed to be what you were drawn to. Uh, tell us what, what it was like for you going to school. Well, I, arts was what I was drawn to because my mother always told me that I was a good artist when I was a kid, and <clears throat> she was totally lying to me. <laughs> 
um, but I thought art school was, was a good place to go, and so I, I did, and I discovered this thing called graphic design, and I just fell madly in love, and, and for the first time in my life, I kind of had a vision for a career that I hadn't thought about before, because we came to Canada for a better life for our kids. And that's all we were focused on. And so, you know, I, I, was, I was just trying to be a good mom. And um, I have amazing kids. And I've, I, I feel like I've had nothing to do with that. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, because I went back to school. And I was busy all the time. And the house was dirty all the time. And we were having leftover pizza three days in a row. And, you know, like it was just, it was all this new transition again, trying to, to learn all these new things. Like going to art school with all these young, uber-talented kids and, and having huge gaps in your knowledge of popular culture is hard. Yeah. You know, and so it's, again, lots and lots of, of, of new things. So then how do you go from having barely any work experience to then becoming the founder and creative director of your own company? That, that, was, that was mostly my stubbornness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I lived my entire life with people telling me what to do. And all of a sudden now I, I, I didn't need that. And so working for someone was really hard for me because um, I, I felt handcuffed. I didn't have a say in how the company was going to be run, how culture was built, how, um, in, uh, how clients were treated. And I just really wanted to try it my way. And then um, I had an opportunity um, to start my own business with two um, amazing women. And, and we did. And I just jumped feet first. And, and you know, we, we became this creative powerhouse that one so many international awards. I think we were ranked number seven in Canada. My so, goodness. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> and still, uh, one thing that you say as a boss and a leader, gender inequality is still something that surprises you in our country. I want to get this right, but you said, as someone from a country where women have no rights, I found the way people talked about female achievement condescending. By applauding female achievement as something astounding, we seem to be selling ourselves short. Can you explain? So when I got off the plane and I, and I came to Canada, the, the one thing that I knew about this country, and I didn't know very much, this is like pre-Google everything <laughs> days, um, I, I knew that this was the land of equality and justice and freedom and, and that anybody could do anything that they wanted in this country. And, and, and I, I still believe that. Um, However, th that is not a Canadian problem. It's a global problem, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a problem in the Western world, and yet it is, you know. Um, it's harder for women to succeed, and all of a sudden there's this glass ceiling that I'd never even thought about. And, and I remember the first time I heard it, I'm like, what do you mean, like applauding women for being awesome and, and contributing and, and this tireless, courageous acts of, of uh, participating in society? Like, why are we looking at it like something special? It's normal that's what we do and uh, and then I, I faced my first uh, uh, issue um, so we had this we pitched this client and uh, it was a group of men and, and my team were mostly women and we had uh, we were pitching this golf course and uh, we didn't get the job and when we had a debrief with them he said uh, you know we our audience is mostly men and we didn't think that you would um, understand them and he also said you had the best pitch, oh. the best presentation, <laughs> the best strategy. Right? And so, you know, I, I, I can understand it better. I can understand it better from so many different perspectives of how difficult it is. Um, mm -hmm. So are you seeing, has it, do you think that things are improving or have you seen anything that's improving for entre female entrepreneurs in Canada? I think um, things are improving uh, greatly in, in, in leaps and bounds. The federal government has put $2 billion into uh, uh, this woman entrepreneurship strategy and, and many other things. So, yeah, there's a lot more female funders um, and things are improving. However, last year there was a pool of $85 billion that were available for startups um, from venture capitalists. And women-led uh, women businesses only got 2% of that. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's a oh, staggering so. number. It uh, is. You yourself have won a lot of awards for being an ambassador for UNICEF. You've said something that rang out to us as, think like an immigrant. Why is that so important? Um, you know, and I, I think that was a talk I did for the walrus. And, and it, 
immigrants, when they come to this country, like when we come, we don't come to take anything away. We don't come to get a handout from the government. We come here for a better life for our kids and our families. And we come here to contribute, right, to build the country, to, to build businesses and, and, and to do well. And, and I think that's the piece that we sometimes don't look at as much. And, and I'm just going to throw this out there. A uh, quarter of new businesses today are started by immigrants. Wow. wow. So. It's amazing. It's huge. Yeah. Well, Zari, talk about the importance of entrepreneurship that is the backbone.